Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld with a digital rebar training video. Uh, in this case, um, we're going to cover Ansible and digital rebar. Uh, this is a little bit of an informal uh, presentation. We'll probably wrap this up into more, more formal training. So it's more of a uh, rack and internal training piece. But if you're listening to this, that's fine. Uh, we want you to be educated about how we do Ansible because there's a ton of ways we do it. And so we're going to walk through those things and then show you some automation that we've been building. Um, this focuses on one path um, and there are many. So sit back, dig in. I'm going to go um, through a lot of detail on this because uh, we really want to be specific here. Uh, and before I get into the, the, the Ansible context path, uh, which is our new and shiny cool stuff, um, I do want to go through the many ways that you can Ansible with digital rebar. Um, the first one is dynamic inventory. And I'll actually show you in uh, GitHub provision, digital rebar provision, there's an integrations path. The integrations path has Ansible. And in Ansible, there is this uh, DRP machines.py that generates a dynamic inventory. So in that model, you're, you're using this inventory.py file um, to read the digital rebar API and then include the Ansible playbook. And there's some there's docs about this uh, in the documentation system that describe how to use the dash I and then read in this Python file and then it'll pull in information. Um, and that is really handy if you have an existing playbook. Uh, it maps to the profiles and parameters and does, does all the right stuff to map groups in Ansible to digital rebar profiles. Very powerful. Um, but it's really bypassing digital rebar's automation. So in this case, you're using digital rebar to add the SSH keys and then you're using the Ansible playbook to do all the configuration management outside of any digital rebar process. So great if you have a playbook that works uh, like CoopSpray. Uh, very minimal setup from that perspective, but also very minimal support or assistance from DRP short of prepping the machines. We, we have customers who have existing playbooks that they want to use and run in a much more parallel way under digital rebar management, and that's this local play from runner. That is, the, that is a stage in the core library, in the task library. So. You should check that out if, you, if you're in this. It requires you to be running local playbooks. So you have to have a playbook that is not designed for SSH, but to run using a local host. And then there's a whole bunch of logic in this local Ansible task to uh, pull down that playbook from a variety of locations ch or check it out from Git. Um, very, very powerful if you have good existing uh, playbooks and highly performant because unlike this model where you are relying on Ansible SSHing and, and your client and parallelizing from your client. In this case, we're using digital rebar parallelization. And so each machine is basically completely autonomous and, and running full hilt. Of course, we capture logs and things like that back like we always do. But uh, this is a much more scalable way, but it's designed for local playbooks. So you've given up some of the roles and groups and the integrations across machines uh, that you might have already built. And if you built them, use the other model. If you haven't, try and take advantage of what we've been doing to store state. It's much more productive than a static state file. Model three, the tower plugin. Uh, once again, customer driven development here. We had uh, customers who had a significant investment in Ansible playbooks through tower and, and like the security and controls that you got through tower. And so in that case, we were able to build a workflow that prepped the environment, added the SSH keys, of course, and then invoked the Tower plugin. So the Tower plugin calls back to Tower and starts a job for that server. Um, and then it runs the playbook for you. So it's a playbook runner doing all the normal things like pattern number one, but you are off the hook from a um, management perspective, right? It, it runs it in a secured environment. And so if Tower is your thing or the open version of it, AWX, um, Plugin, download the plugin at Tower Plugin, and should should work out pretty pretty well. We actually did this in patterns where you had to reboot servers, and so we would after the Tower job was over, we'd pick up and wait for it to finish, and then we could do other downstream tasks, uh, just like I'm I'm showing in the graphics. Uh, where it gets more interesting to us is effectively Rackn implementing Tower features and functionality using contexts. So the context runner. 
um, we have an Ansible version of that that I'm going to show you uh, in, in demo, that is able to run a content playbook. And so it can then pull in information from a server. It's really designed to do one server at a time. You could get, get sophisticated and do multiple servers, but the designs are really towards one server. But where you would actually go in and transfer the context to the uh, Ansible context, it's really in a Docker container, take whatever actions you wanted, um, it injects the machine object into the action, I'll show you that, and then it also stores data at the end of a run. Um, and so you could create multiple playbooks that you've uh, cobbled together uh, to create a, a, a process. And in this case, you would be in the middle of a DRP run, you would go SSH and then run it. Uh, I want a word of caution on this. If you have this model, use the local, try to use the local Ansible runners. It's gonna be much more parallel. Uh, in this case, you know, you're relying on the digital rebar inf server infrastructure to run that playbook, and there will be scale limits based on that. Um, and there, there are ways that you can take contexts and run them in a Kubernetes cluster or offload them so that they're not running on the server. Uh, but it just doesn't parallelize as well as just running that, that playbook on the system itself. So if you're in this model, in the middle of a string of tasks, uh, do consider running it as a local playbook uh, model number two rather than this. But there are very good reasons why you do want to do this uh, and take the risk of scaling. And uh, it's a little bit more of a complex layout here. Uh, and I'll, this is what we're going to dig into and show you. And the reason you would do this is if you want to run actions from the context of DRP or the machine doesn't even exist yet, um, and so a good example of this would be if I want to automate a switch in the middle of a run and set something up, I have a playbook to automate the switch. That's exactly where you would use this. Uh, you have to be aware of the scaling, potential scaling boundaries, but it's very handy to be able to move back to the server where it might be able to talk to the switch's control interface and take actions. Um, harder for me to simulate, so I'm, I'm going to show you similar concepts, but using cloud providers. So in the specific case that we're talking about, we're using the Docker context, using a local host Ansible playbook to talk to the cloud APIs, spin up a new machine, collect the IP address and other information from that cloud API, inject our, our public key onto the machine. So set up a managed server, and then a second playbook uh, that SSH is in to do the join up script. So we, we normally would have a, you'd have to type a command or run a, run a cloud init process to do this. By using the Ansible playbook, we can just let Ansible SSH in and do whatever operations we need. Once we do that, then we're into DRP task land, and that's a great place to be. So we're going to be able to just run uh, digital rebar tasks as we would expect to. So uh, you know, we have a little bit of the performance risk of running the playbook on the back end, the, on the front end, but it's really to set up the machine. Once the machine's set up, we're not going to need to go back to that context. Uh, at all, we're going to stay in the digital rebar context where we have a lot more control. And that would include if you had additional playbook steps to do, just run them as local playbooks on the machine itself. This is strictly a bootstrapping uh, flow and therefore it does scale quite nicely. And I want to take you through a swim lane version of the same thing so you can see me sort of build this up, then I'll show you how this works. There is another video of this where I do a demo of just this. This is not your demo. Um, so I'm going to go quickly here. The purpose of this is to actually dig in deeper in how this is built and how you can replicate uh, the pattern, uh, not just create a, a cool demo for you. So in this context example, we have a digital rebar endpoint uh, where we're going to create a machine with state data. And then um, we also have already pre-populated the Ansible runner, Ansible container uh, from a context perspective. I'm using Linode as a demo here. It has a cloud API. And then we ultimately want to be running in the server's context where we can do highly parallelized work on the system itself using the runner for where it's strong. So in this case, what we want to be able to do is um, start a workflow that starts a series of tasks. The first thing we need is to generate a key and store the key. Then we're going to call a create instance task, uh, which is an Ansible task that's cloud specific. Uh, uses the credentials and passes in. That actually tells the cloud APIs to create a machine, which is great. Once that machine is created, where it's going to tell us information like its IP address, its uh, identifiers, and internal information, we're going to take that information, store it, 
in the machine state and then hand off to a different playbook um, and actually a completely different task. And that will then run the join up script. The join up script is um, bootstrapping script. Uh, and one of the nice things about this is this is not a generic join up script. It's actually the join up script for the machine because we're calling it we, with the machine's UUID in there. I'll show you how that, that works. That's an important nuance in this because join up itself, ideally you would disable join up uh, if you're on a public server because you don't want anybody to be able to run that script and add a server into the infrastructure, even if they're they're locked from how they what they could do. Um, so you want to be able to turn off the basic discovery and rely on the machine's individual discovery, which does which is exactly what happens if you create the machine and then put it in the right workflow. Uh, from there, that workflow would, would include discover and the other tasks, which will then inventory the machine and install the agent on a persistent base and go ahead and do workflow. So at that point, you can do something, but you can be ready to do whatever you need. You're back into a ready state. Whew, that's a lot of bits and pieces. Um, and I want to show you what that looks like over here. Um, I already have a machine that I've created for this. Um, I'll create another one in, in a moment because this one's been used a couple times. Uh, you can see I've already, I'm gonna go ahead and disable the debug flag. There we go. Uh, turning on that during debugging gives you additional, uh, turns on dash E so you can actually see everything that's going on in a, in a job log process, which is super handy. Um, and you can see that we've created the public and private keys for this system. Um, the private key is stored in a encrypted of course um, and then in a format that we have to pull out and there's a public there's a task library stage that that does this work this is all uh, not all of this is yet in the task library but it's all moving from our open uh, multi-site manager where we've, I've been playing with this into our task library so it's just generic available as a generic um, operation that should happen in in or before the 4.3 uh, release goes to final release so uh, let's let's go ahead and um, I'm going to decompose this a little bit before I create a whole new machine. In this case, um, I will run this one to create the system. So we do want we have this Linode Ansible Linode create, and then when that runs, um, it switched it to the Ansible uh, context. It's running the Ansible apply to create it, and then it'll run through the join up. Um, in the process, and so we can actually see that uh, running that playbook. And then once again, I've done a demo of this where I, th I spent a little bit more time on it. I really want to show you how it's doing this. Um, and then from my, our Linode infrastructure, it's created the machine and it's going to get the IP address and, and share that back. Um, and right now we're doing what's handy, which is waiting for the instances to boot and checking the, to see that the SSH port is. So this is a self-contained module from that perspective. If I want to do something very similar to this, um, what I can do is come over to, uh, this is the same, this is attached to that environment. I'm playing an edge lab also on this, and I can say uh, DRPCLI machines create. Um, and what I need to do is create a machine. So this is, a, I'm gonna create a machine named demo uh, for this training. And I do want it to start on a specific workflow. Uh, so I'm going to say workflow is uh, discover base. So I'm not trying to create a Linode specific. I'm just trying to start the machine. And I also want to uh, start it with a base context. So in this case, I'm going to give it a meta uh, base context. I'm going to tell it to use the runner base context. Not the Ansible. The runner is just the, hey, start an agent for me super handy that way. And that should be all I need to create the machine, assuming no typos, go to created. You'll see I've got the refresh. So here's my, my demo machine and it's already gone through the discover base sledge hammer weight and everything's good to go. If I want to, and I don't have an IP address, I haven't done any of the join up work at all. This is now actually running the join up script, which is super nice. Um, and it's done also. So from that, uh, let's see, yeah, all right. So it's still catching up with, with where things are going. This demo machine I've created, uh, I haven't gone anywhere yet, I just created a base machine. 
So what I want to do is show you um, where things are going from that perspective and, and how, how, how these next few steps are going to go. And the best place to do that is actually to pull it into uh, some code, code view. Let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. No. Oh, yeah, I am making it bigger. We just have to have some files. So for this to work, I'm going to go over to our multi-site demo uh, where I've been playing with this. Once again, this is all going to migrate to core library. Some of it already already is. Um, and from that perspective, let's start with our workflow. So we have a workflow. Oh, I have it in the Linode. So it's, it, the challenge with this is that the workflow that creates the Linode system and I would have one for AWS, for Google, Microsoft, for VMware. Um, these are specific. Uh, the Ansible runner, Ansible apply is generic, but because every cloud has its own interface definition, you're going to end up with uh, cloud specific, API specific uh, workflows uh, and, and stages and templates from that perspective. Um, and this is adapted from our Terraform. Terraform has a very similar pattern here. So we have a stage called Ansible Low Node Create. And then this is really generic after that. So we, we have a context clear that says, hey, don't I need to switch from being in the Ansible context to being in the uh, machines context. So I clear the context. And then I just want to run through a normal discover network firewall D uh, runner service that installs the runner. It's just like I would do any normal discovery process. They're all linked together here because I'm creating the machine and then I'm handing it off um, instead of starting a new workflow. That gives you a lot of control in what is gonna happen. So if you wanted, you could build this uh, workflow and then start installing things or adding whatever stages you wanted to add, uh, you know, build a cluster, per verify a machine, notify other systems. It's all pretty straightforward. And that's nice because we're not just using a generic discovery. This is a create and discover combined uh, system. And I have a very similar one for destroy, although destroy only has to do the destroy. Um, so let's look at what those uh, stages look like. The Linode create is the only one that's custom here and the only one that's really that interesting. Uh, and in, the, in, in here, we have a task uh, where we switch the context to be Ansible. And that is actually telling the system to move into a uh, context for the Ansible system. We call RSA key create, uh, which is generic, but it's handy to call it in the Ansible runner where or the Ansible um, context where we already we, we definitely have the SSH key pieces. So that will do the right work for key creation. Uh, I'm not going to dig into that too much. You just it basically creates the parameters on the machine with the unique key and then makes them available as parameters. Ansible apply and Ansible join up are the two things that we want to cover today that are, that are sort of interesting. Uh, and the way Ansible apply is going to work is that it's going to use this Ansible playbook templates list. So it's going to expect you to have created one or more Ansible playbooks. Um, and we did it this way because we want to be able to have generic Ansible capabilities that you can then modify and, and not assume that you're only calling one playbook. Uh, it could be that you want to talk to the um, network provider. You want to set up a, a, a VLAN. You want to set up, you, know, you want to talk to internal tooling and cloud tooling in the same setup process. Um, all reasonable stuff to do. And so it's a, it's a, it's a list of, of templates. So the thing to do next is to actually look at what the that template is. Notice we're still in the Linode. This is I'm looking at the Linode specific pieces first. And so we're looking for Ansible Linode provision. And when we look at this, it's a very generic, um, if you're used to Ansible, very comfortable looking Ansible playbook. Um, it's a local host playbook because we're just running on the system. We're on the in the container itself. And we're using the user that's been defined. And then we're calling, this is the bulk of the work, we're calling the Linode create uh, system. So this is where it's cloud specific. Um, the only place actually where it's cloud specific. 
but it has to be like this because of the way we've created cloud API systems. Um, so I specify the information I need to create the machine. In this case, we already have parameters uh, for Linode, so they're not hard coded. Um, we pull in the machine's name as its label, which is nice. The authorized keys, we can literally just jump, dump in the RSA public key straight from their parameter. Tagging is always friendly, so it makes things easy to find, and we say present. The destroy is exactly the same, except the state is absent. Uh, and then we store the variable that comes back out of the system. And you'll notice in my highlighting, what I have done is I now take that data and I use it in the downstream actions. And the downstream actions um, are really about collecting data back for digital rebar. So in this case, I want the address and there's a special behavior in the task that's calling this that will look for a file called machine name dot address dot text dash address dot text. And if it finds that, um, it will save it as the machine's address. Super handy. Um, there's a special behavior in destroy that if you say delete me as the name, as the address, it'll remove it. I'll show you how that look, what that looks like. But this is basically allowing us to get the address and store it in the correct place in digital rebar in a consistent, repeatable way where you can just build a playbook that saves the file and down digital rebar does the right thing. And then the same is true for output from playbook. So in this case, we just take that whole module and we sit, call it, put it in machine name.json and digital rebar will pull it in and save it as a parameter on the machine. I'll show you exactly what that looks like in a moment. And then, and then we wait. So we don't have to do this. We could just let the next playbook downstream wait, get in a, in a hold loop, but it's nice to um, error out here inside of the task that created the machine and then put the pause here. So this task does all of the work to get the machine ready and then digital rebar will, will pick up and keep running. But that's, that's literally just waiting for the SSH port to be available. Move this out of the way for a moment. Trying to. And then, um, so if we come back over into this machine here, what you'll see is there's an Ansible output and this is literally the uh, object that's created internal to Amazon and we're just saving it uh, and passing it back into digital rebar. The thing that's powerful about this is that means any data that's here is available to the next uh, template in the file, the next playbook in the file or any downstream action. So I can then get information about the machine from a separate playbook. I don't have to have that, I don't have to be in that playbook to get information that was generated in that playbook. So very powerful playbook chaining feature. Um, and you could actually do the same thing to chain Terraform to Ansible, Ansible to Terraform, um, or other systems. So, uh, you know, this is really about maintaining state, which is what Digital Rebar does very well. If I come over into my demo machine, uh, I don't have that. I only have the go high inventory that was generated from the context uh, container because um, we do run go high on pretty much everything. So this is giving you information about the server, uh, digital rebar server. Okay, so next. Next thing we need to do is look at the actual code that calls this. And so there is an Ansible apply stage over here. Oh, let's see. Yeah, that's fine. We don't need to go back. Um, and so in this stage, we're gonna, we need our, our, our keys, we need our templates, all that looks great. And then uh, from there, we're gonna do a couple of things. Uh, and once again, pretty straightforward. We're gonna retrieve the key pairs and store them in files and known locations. Pretty straightforward. We're gonna tell our key checking to false. Uh, Ansible um, does not, if we keep running this against the same machines, uh, or actually more likely if our key changes, uh, if we take the same digital rebar machine and run create, destroy, create, destroy, the keys won't, key signatures won't match, and this enables us to get past that. Um, and then we basically are going to use a range to iterate over the playbooks, uh, the templates that we've, we've defined. So each one, we're gonna have to copy it out as a playbook, so that's what this does. We are going to pull the address data because uh, we need that to be fed into the, the play. And then we're gonna run Ansible playbook uh, with the address that we had, with our key, and then we're gonna pass in extra variables, digital rebar uh, dot JSON. So the nice thing about doing this is that it will make the, the all of the machine values available. 
and they get picked up every time. So we do this dynamically. It's not relying on a parameter to do it. It's relying on an API fetch. So inside of this loop, you're going to get fresh data each time. Uh, and that runs it. And then this is where we capture the data back. So we're capturing the address. If you say remove is how it removes the address. Um, and then we capture the results and we end. It's, it really is that simple. Um, most of this is sort of prepping the environment, running it, and then just collecting the data back. And that's it. Uh, if I wanted to create my own template, I would just create a new template, upload it, add it, create a task that called it, and then I'd be able to go. Um, so I'm not going to walk you through exactly that task. It's, it's pretty straightforward to go through and create a brand new template. Um, I could create one for AWS and I'd have to update my um, parameters, the, the YAML and the playbook to be AWS specific and follow their formats. But once I did, I'd be able to just do that, create the machine and then call the join up script. Join up is different. Um, it's still calling a playbook, but it's doing it specifically and only to so it builds a playbook right here on the spot um, to join up a machine. So that one, since it's special purpose, we actually build, the, we don't have a template, we just build the playbook right here. Um, and in that case, what you can see it doing is it creates the machine's RSID field. So we're not calling this generic join up, we're actually calling it with the machine's UUID pre-known, changes the join up behavior to attach to the machine we've already created. And then on over here, we're downloading the join up script and then we're running the join up script as a no hop. So it's not delaying. Um, we, we actually want this to start and then we need to get out of the way so that the next tasks can pick it up. And there's some little bit of nice cleanups that we do um, and a little bit of, um, oh, this is all the prep. We then mark the machine with red and green so we know when things are going. Then we call the playbook with the machine's address. Once again, straightforward playbook. This is not supposed to be hard or difficult to troubleshoot, but this is a very narrow, narrow function thing. So we want join up to work consistently across all systems. And so we, we separate it out as its own thing. So when you look at that, if I was to then go take demo, hopefully it'll make more sense. I say Ansible Linode create, and now it's going through the exact system. It just created the key. Now it's building that playbook going through and building all these all these pieces. If I want to look at the actual playbook, I'm not going to do this because this actually does have my keys and things like that. I can expand the temp rendering system. It'll show you exactly the playbook with all of the data injected into it uh, from that, that perspective. And so it's going through, it's creating the Linode um, system. And now we're once again waiting for that, that port to close or that port to be available. Once it's available, we're going to switch over, run the Ansible join up and that will complete the operations for the system. And then if I wanted to take those one of these machines, I can then do any action against it. So I've been testing, say, our Kubernetes install process here. I can start that process. Just I now have control of the machine as if it's a normal digital rebar machine with a runner on it. Um, and it's going to go through and install Kubernetes um, really quickly. Uh, and that's sort of the whole whole point. All right, well, maybe it won't. Maybe I have an error in that Kubernetes thing I need to debug. Um, so we're now in join up phase. The join up script is, is going through. I switch back to the, the other machine I was looking at. So I'm in join up. Here we go. Um, and so it's going, it has to go through it. Ansible's not particularly fast. I get spoiled with digital rebar. Um, but it's going to go through and, and build and run that process for us. Um, probably waiting until the machine's all the way up because SSH does not mean the machine's quite ready for automation. Um, cool. And that's it. Uh, what you should do is, you know, this this is right now in the rack and multi-site manager code by 4.3, um, so mid-February. Uh, this stuff will have, the these templates, um, the Linode stuff as an example won't, but the Ansible apply, Ansible join up um, scripts and the context pieces to bootstrap the context will all have made it into the core library. And yeah, I should mention in this, there is a workflow uh, we're bringing a whole bunch of bootstrapping 
uh, pieces into the system. So there are specific tasks um, around bootstrapping the system. And one of them that you'll want for this is the bootstrap context. Um, and this, this bootstrap context is pretty remarkable. It'll install Docker, multi-platform, um, and then it will uh, pull down Docker, pull down or build Docker containers for whatever context you've built. Um, that's going to need its own real demo. But in this case, the Ansible context um, actually specifies a Docker file that pulls down off the internet, builds that Docker file, and then stuffs it back in digital rebar for consumption. So lot this has made it very, very easy to get started with um, contexts. Uh, and that's why it's going to be in the 4.3 release as a, as a complete thing. And you'll be able to literally just bootstrap the Docker context um, have it installed on your back end and then be able to start running running these after you create the appropriate uh, context. So very, very powerful base uh, capabilities that uh, will literally just pop into the system automatically. Uh, I hope this was helpful. If you have questions, um, it's exciting, you want to play with it, uh, the code is out there. Uh, today it's in the uh, RackN multi-site manager, multi-site demo piece where we have a ton of examples on how to build and implement. We sort of use this as a cutting edge uh, playground. And then um, the other pieces will come into Digital Rebar. Sorry, Digital Rebar, Provision Content, where the task, where the task library is, uh, where a lot of these, these pieces come, come in. Whoa, it's way down because of T's in the task library. This is Rob Hirschfeld signing out.